Hey everybody, welcome back to History Student Reacts. Today we'll be watching the Battle of Munda by Historia Civilis. So, last time we saw Caesar establishing his power base in Rome and trying to quell some of the unrest that was developing. But, at the end of last episode, we saw a new uprising starting in Spain. And that uprising was led by Caesar's former ally and right-hand man, Labinus. In fact, since Labinus left Caesar after he betrayed the Republic, he has been one of Caesar's most devoted enemies. So, presumably, this video is going to be about Caesar versus Labinus once again. I'm excited to get into that, but before we do, I would appreciate it if you guys would check out the Patreon or become a channel member to get access to exclusive reaction content. Anyway, with that out of the way, let's jump into this reaction. Alright, let's go. By the beginning of the year 45 BCE, Rome's dictator, consul, Pontifex Maximus, and fledgling authoritarian Julius hmm. Caesar received word that Rome's two Spanish provinces had fallen into enemy hands. And by the way, what you'll notice amongst those titles attributed to Caesar, emperor was not among them. Now, I feel there's a somewhat common misconception amongst those who aren't that familiar with Roman history that Julius Caesar was the first Roman emperor. This is untrue. Augustus, Caesar's successor, was the first Roman emperor. Caesar simply laid the groundwork. Uh, that is certainly true, but Caesar himself was not the first emperor. He was sort of the predecessor to that system. Augustus would really set up the empire and establish the precedents that emperors would follow after he was gone. Um, though Caesar definitely uh, prepared Rome for that. I mean, the Republic was definitely gone at this point. And of course, Caesar was the dictator of Rome. So he had uh, dictatorial power, he had authoritarian power. He was, in some ways, an emperor in all but name, but he was not officially the first Roman emperor. The enemy was none other than Caesar's old right-hand man, Titus Labinus. Yep. Caesar and Labinus were exactly the same age, and may have known each other as far back as childhood, although this is impossible to prove definitively. Yeah, and you know, we talked about in earlier episodes, um, particularly the episodes on Caesar's conquests in Gaul, how Labinus was also incredibly talented. You know, Labinus was a man who could have had an independent political and military career, but instead chose to be loyal to Caesar and sort of hitch his wagon to Caesar's career. And so both men, um, both of whom were very talented around the same age, they rose together. Though, of course, Caesar would always rise higher because he was the man uh, at the front of everything. It was his name, his face on all the conquests. But Labinus played a big role in many of Caesar's accomplishments. By the time the two burst onto the political scene in the 60s BCE, they were already close friends and stalwart political allies. Caesar was always the most charismatic of the two, and when he was elected consul for the year 59, he helped Labinus get elected to the lesser office of preacher for the same year. When their terms were up, Caesar secured for himself a prestigious governorship, and as his first order of business, he asked Labinus to come along as his number two. Labinus accepted, even though he was qualified for a province in his own right. The two men spent the next decade bringing Gaul under the Roman yoke. Yeah, you know, they did everything together. And I do wonder, and I said this, you know, episodes ago when we talked about Labinus splitting from Caesar, there's no evidence of this, so this is complete speculation. I do wonder if there was a little bit of brewing resentment from Labinus towards Caesar. I mean, Labinus had been with Caesar for more than 10 years, and while both their careers had gone fantastically, I you got to imagine that someone like Labinus might have been thinking, after a decade, you know, maybe I should do something on my own. <laughs> maybe I could have my own independent career. Now, maybe not. There are examples of, you know, right-hand men like Agrippa or Belisarius, who were extremely talented just as, or more talented than the man who they served, but were always loyal, always satisfied with staying in that second-hand, right-hand man position. Maybe Labinus was like that, I don't know. But I feel like for a lot of people in that position, they might have been getting a little antsy, sort of wanting to escape from under Caesar's tutelage and do their own thing, maybe. 
This would forever be Caesar's greatest military achievement. And many would argue, in fact, I think I would argue, that Labinus deserves at least 50% of the credit for this. Mm. When the Civil War kicked off, Labinus shocked everybody by siding with the Roman Senate. We yeah. don't have a clear picture of why he made this decision, but it appears to have come from a genuine place. Yeah, I mean, from what we can tell, he was genuinely outraged that Caesar had betrayed the Republic, uh, which was an institution that Labinus believed in. Um, and that's probably true, but once again, no evidence for this. Of course, we really couldn't have any evidence. How would we know? I do wonder if some of those feelings that he potentially had might have contributed you know, maybe this presented an opportunity for Labinus to do his own thing, to be a man independent from Caesar. Maybe he had those feelings, and maybe consciously or subconsciously they contributed to his decision. We don't know. What we do know is that he did seem pretty upset by what Caesar had done. Caesar extended many olive branches, but Labinus would slap down every offer. Over the next several years, Labinus became a zealous defender of Republican institutions. One of Caesar's main enemies, and I think what we can say is that he definitely grew to dislike Caesar and the Caesarians. Um, you know, makes sense, he was fighting a civil war with them, but by later in the civil war he really had no mercy or empathy or friendship left in his heart for Caesar uh, and Caesar's allies, whom of course he had once been a part of. And now, after the deaths of Pompey and Cato and Scipio and countless others, Labinus was finally the leader of the Pompeian faction. I guess if he did want to be his own man, you know, go his own way, <laughs> I guess he's finally gotten what he wanted, um, because the other leaders of the Pompeians are all dead. Of course, most importantly, Pompey. Pompey has now died a while ago, but these uh, rebellions and uprisings have continued remarkably long after he was already gone. Um, Cato's gone. He was probably maybe the second most important leader. Maybe Cicero was, but Cicero left voluntarily. So, you know, the, the hardliner Cato, he's gone too. So it's basically just Labinus. And, and there's other prominent figures, but among the names that we would know and we would recognize, it is basically just Labinus or what was left of it. He knew exactly what to do. Unrest in the Spanish provinces meant that they still required a strong military presence, and many of these legions had spent some time on the Pompeian side of the Civil War. Mm. As Caesar's legions back in Rome became rich beyond their wildest dreams, the Spanish legions became more and more unhappy. Makes sense. I mean, when we saw the initial um, Civil War breakout, uh, the Pompeians had sprung up in the east, in Greece, and in Spain. So I'm sure some of those legions were pretty loyal to Pompey. Not to mention, the Spanish provinces have never really been Caesar's thing. He's always been located in Gaul. Uh, his legions came from that area, and they've been loyal to Caesar, and they're finally reaping the rewards. So you could see how the Spanish legionaries could be a little frustrated. You know, they first off lost the civil war. Many of them sided with Pompey, and they lost. And now they're seeing Caesar having all these great triumphs and all of his men are getting paid off. And they're not going to be very happy. For Labinus, conditions were perfect. After joining forces with two of Pompey's sons, Labinus launched an attack on the Spanish provinces. Mm. Resistance was extremely light. And before too long, entire legions were coming over to Labinus's side in droves. Labinus then began to raise additional legions from local recruits, which proved to be extremely successful. According to estimates, Labinus raised something like 13 legions in basically no time at all. This was wow. huge. That's an incredible number. Uh, and it's maybe not too surprising when we consider Caesar has really only just gotten Rome truly under control. Uh, the Empire, or the Republic, whatever you want to call it at this point, has been in an era of civil strife for years. So there's going to be a lot of unhappy people. There's a lot of people who favored Pompey. There's a lot of people who don't really care either way. Um, but you're going to be able to find a lot of people who are dissatisfied with how things are going. It was more than Caesar faced at Pharsalus under Pompey or at Thapsus under Scipio. But the more important fact is this. 
Caesar knew that unlike Pompey and Scipio, Labinus was his equal. Hmm. His astounding momentum in Spain put the entire political order at risk. Yeah. The stakes could not have been higher. This is also, by the way, just such a Caesar moment. <laughs> Seems like every episode he manages to get himself into a worse situation. Now, he always manages to escape to his credit, but every time we see him, sometimes it's his fault, sometimes it's not his fault. He's in an even more dangerous, life-threatening situation than he was the last time. Caesar had no choice but to intervene immediately. He left Lepidus, his new number two, mm. in charge of the city of Rome, and departed with whatever legions happened to be nearby. Okay. Since he had just retired a massive number of soldiers, this worked out to approximately eight legions, a mere 60% of what Labinus had at his disposal. This mm. was uh, not great, but time was of the essence and it would have to do. It's worth mentioning here that Caesar recruited as an aide-de-camp his late sister's grandson, the 17-year-old Gaius Octavius. Oh. The boy didn't really do anything on the campaign, but like I said, it's worth mentioning. Oh, it is worth mentioning. Not to spoil too much, but um, this is the man who will become known as Augustus, who I mentioned earlier as the first Roman emperor. So he is definitely worth keeping, out, keeping an eye on. Uh, and in following Historius Villa's videos, I suspect we will be seeing a lot of this young man. There, I've mentioned it. <laughs> Consider it mentioned. Before going any further, let me make it clear that this campaign is pretty badly sourced. The only contemporaneous account is anonymous and borderline unreadable. Historians have been able to piece together a plausible account of what happened, but mm. be forewarned that the evidence for any of this is pretty thin. Keeping that in mind, I always appreciate when creators, uh, history creators, uh, let us know that the sourcing is spotty or they're using these particular sources. It's always worth keeping in mind if we're looking at ancient history that sources can be few and far between and we get situations like this where we really do not have great sources. So we sort of have to piece together uh, what we have and try and work out what happened as best we can. But nevertheless, here we go. Caesar and his eight legions set a breakneck pace and were able to make it to Spain in record time. Mm. When they arrived, Labinus and the Pompeians were in the middle of besieging one of Spain's last holdouts, the town of Iulia. As we know, Caesar was outnumbered. He didn't want to risk attacking an entrenched position if he could avoid it, so instead he marched on Cordoba, one of Spain's largest cities, hoping that the Pompeians would abandon their siege and give chase. The plan mostly worked. A small detachment stayed behind to continue the siege, but Labinus and the rest of the army moved to intercept Caesar. Labinus launched hit-and-run attacks, but Caesar refused to face his enemy head-on. <laughs> the two. Yeah, that's probably smart. Keep in mind, Caesar is facing a much larger force led by a man who he considers his equal and who I think many of us would say is maybe as talented as Caesar. I I'm not sure how you'd put forth the direct comparison of the two. I mean, Caesar definitely achieved a lot more than Labinus did, but part of Caesar's achievements came from Labinus. So it's kind of tough to compare them. Um, I mean, I think Caesar was probably more crafty probably more talented at this sort of thing, but Labinus is either an equal in combat or close to an equal, so still a very risky situation. Two sides slowly settled into a weird standoff. Caesar seized a few nearby towns for supplies, but other than that, nobody seemed too eager to initiate battle. Over the winter, the Pompeian army saw some defections. These were mostly from local Spanish soldiers, who were understandably more concerned with the fate of Spanish towns than they mm. were with some Roman political dispute. <laughs> Labinus sought to minimize future defections by pulling back to the town of Munda. From oh. here, he would plan his next move. Oh. 
Labinus eventually decided that defections and the threat of future Caesarian reinforcements meant that a prolonged campaign was no longer in his interest. This cat and mouse stuff had to end. Okay. He found a good defensive hill near the town of Munda and planted his army there. Now all he had to do was trick Caesar into attacking. Caesar led his army to the town of Munda and a I'm curious to see how Caesar handles this because I mean we've seen Caesar's tactical brilliance. He could find an amazing way around this. Um, Caesar's faced enemies with fantastic positions before and he somehow managed to remove them from those positions or negate the advantages that they've had. Though at other times he's just gotten incredibly lucky. <laughs> so I'm curious to see if this is going to be one of Caesar's master strokes, a brilliant moment of tactics and strategy, or if this is going to be one of those Caesar got damn lucky <laughs> moments. Approached Labinus's hill. For the first time, Caesar and Labinus faced each other as equals. Wow. The future of Rome hung in the balance. Caesar moved his cavalry to the left, and his most experienced legions to the wings. Then Caesar did exactly what Labinus wanted him to do. He attacked uphill. Okay, it's a pretty simple strategy. Uh, nothing too crafty or tricky, at least yet. There were no clever tricks or maneuvers, just each side pushing against the other. Sweating wow. and bleeding and dying over every inch of ground gained or lost. It was muddy and brutal and exhausting, and it Jeez. went on all day. Okay, well, I don't know how this is going to change, if it will change, but so far, this is one of those Caesar just goes for it moments. He's decided that it's better for him to just charge, rush right in, instead of trying to, you know, work around his enemy or figure something else out. No, he's not doing his usual Caesar craftiness. He's just going for it. As the sun approached the horizon, the two sides were basically at a stalemate. Perhaps Caesar expected Labinus's army to collapse within the first minutes of fighting. If so, that had been a mistake. The Caesarians were now fully committed outnumbered and outpositioned. Uh -oh. Caesar could see the writing on the wall. He jumped down off his horse, grabbed a sword and a shield, and <laughs> charged the Pompeian line. Oh my god! He probably didn't actually see any combat, but that doesn't matter. The soldiers got the message. Okay, well, you know this is a desperate situation because Caesar is whipping out his charm, his charisma. Uh, this is basically Caesar's best quality. Uh, we've talked about before how he's extremely talented at politics because he's so good at appealing to the public. He's always been good at even when his soldiers are angry, he can appeal to them. He can keep them on board. And so now, clearly in a moment of, maybe not desperation, but in a moment during which Caesar is like, oh no, <laughs> we're going to lose this, he's trying his absolute hardest to use his charisma to inspire the men around him. He's saying, you know what? Yeah, I made a mistake. I ran right into this. But if you guys are going down, I'm going down with you. And of course, this is Caesar, who is uniquely charismatic. But in any sort of situation, when your commander, your general, jumps off down his horse and gets down to fight on foot with the rest of the infantry, that's usually a pretty inspiring moment. Win or lose, Caesar would share their fate. And then, on the Caesarian right, one of Caesar's veteran legions broke through the Pompeian line. Mm. Labinus personally took command of a legion that he had been holding in reserve, and charged Caesar's right. Equilibrium was restored. But then, Caesar's cavalry broke through on his left. Labinus was out of reserves. The cavalry swung around and encircled Labinus's position. Oh, the Pompeian wow. army collapsed. Labinus was killed in the fighting. Man, you know, I kind of knew how this was uh, going to end. You could kind of see the writing on the wall. It's also very poetic that Labinus would die in this manner. But it is still sad to see him go. I mean, you remember the good times between him and Caesar, right? And now he's been killed fighting um, a rebellion against Caesar's dictatorial rule. Quite a way to go.
Yeah, so I would say, um, I mean, clearly part of this battle came down to, one, Caesar's ability to inspire his men, and two, Caesar's men being better trained and more disciplined than Labinus's men, of course. But <laughs> this does also seem like this is more one of those Caesar got lucky type moments. You know, this isn't really one of Caesar's master strokes. This is not uh, the best of Caesar. We've seen him perform far better in other situations. He just went for it, and, uh, you know, the the gods favored him that day, and he managed to win. It really could have gone differently. Caesar definitely could have lost this battle. After the battle, Caesar ordered his soldiers to search the battlefield for Labinus' body. Mm. They found it. Caesar buried his old friend with full honors in a field just outside the town of Munda. Wow. You know, I'm not saying that Caesar isn't petty, but I will say one of his positive qualities is that he does seem to be able to move past um, pointless disagreements. Uh, one, when they lo no longer matter. Um, you know, he was upset when Pompey was murdered, he's burying Labinus with honors. I know some of you might be thinking, well, yeah, sure, I mean, it doesn't cost him anything, there's no consequence, but trust me, there's a lot of powerful men throughout history who hold a grudge even past their opponent dying. <laughs> you know, I think many powerful men would uh, have not buried Labinus with honors or felt sorrow upon Pompey being murdered. Um... And, you know, Caesar does do that. And then you have someone like Cicero, who Caesar sees the practicality in working with Cicero, even though Cicero has opposed him several times. So, you know, I mean, Caesar has definitely some flaws, but he does seem to have his emotions in check. You know, he doesn't usually let his emotions get the better of him. He's willing to pivot, make compromises, um, and forgive to a certain extent. Caesar would later say that he had often fought for victory, but at Munda, he fought for his life. Yeah, I can tell. In the coming weeks, one of Pompey's sons would be captured and executed. The other son would evade capture for another decade, but it's safe to say that the Battle of Munda basically put the final nail into the Pompeian coffin. This and, and with the execution of that son, let me be clear, I'm not saying that Caesar wasn't brutal or anything, he did what needed to be done. Um, well, that basically is the point I'm making, he did what needed to be done. Uh, and if he needed to sidle up to someone like Cicero, Caesar would be willing to put his emotions aside and do that, you know, collaborate with someone who he didn't necessarily like. I mean, that was the whole first triumvirate. And at a certain point, you know, Caesar was kind of trying to keep it together when it was already crumbling. And then, like I said, he he doesn't hold grudges past when they're due. <laughs> you know, if you have a grudge against someone and you manage to defeat them in battle and kill them, Caesar's done with it at that point. The Civil War was over, for real this time. All of Caesar's rivals had been defeated. At this wow. moment, he was perhaps the most powerful person on the planet. He would be dead in a year. Damn, that fast. Wow. I didn't know it was that soon afterwards, you know? Um, I mean, obviously, I think we're probably all familiar with how Caesar goes. Um, and... Looks like next time we've got Caesar as king, so we get one more episode on the rule of Julius Caesar, and then we get to his assassination. So we will very soon be coming to Caesar's end, but I'm surprised it was so quick, you know? Um, maybe if Caesar had more time alive, he would have been the first emperor of Rome. Um, you know, if he'd had, I don't know, another decade, two decades, three decades... I mean, who knows what could have happened. But instead, we get the end of Caesar. Uh, and then eventually, we're going to come to Augustus. But that is a long time away from this. Uh, so yeah, I enjoyed this one. It is sad to see Labinus go. But like I said, it is kind of a fitting way to go, considering how his relationship with Caesar has gone. Uh, very poetic. You know, once again, 
very much like a, a Hollywood movie. Uh, a lot of Caesar's story is, uh, you know, I think would make for a great movie. And there have been many movies made about him. But you look at a lot of moments of his life, and you're like, wow, very cinematic. This is one of those. Um, so yeah, I had a good time with this one. Once again, I would appreciate it if you guys would leave a like, subscribe to the channel, uh, check out the Patreon, or become a channel member. I hope you guys are all having a good day today, and I will see you all again next time. Goodbye.